So we've been in the book of James. We've been tracking with our journey. We are on part seven tonight. We've talked about this being a series about authentic faith. The real thing is what we want to be. We want somebody to look at us and be like, mm, yep, that's the real deal. We don't want to be a counterfeit. We want to be fake. We don't have markings on us and in our lives. That someone's like, mm, I don't know what Christian's supposed to be, but that, that ain't one right there. So we're looking at this book, and this book gives us kind of a, kind of a mirror, it kind of holds up a mirror. It says, hey, well, you want to be an authentic Christian? Well, this is you. Now, do you look like you're supposed to look if you want to be an authentic Christian? And so tonight, we're looking at just really, it was one of the easier ones to kind of put together and to kind of sort through because there's so much in the Bible, and there's so much that God's Word says about our words, the power of your words. You know your words are powerful. They affect people around you. You can say things that stick with people. You know the saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I think the person who came up with that has been hurt deeply by words to the point that they equate it with broken bones from rocks and sticks like that's pretty painful and we know i mean every time we hear that growing up you might have heard that from somebody or you might have said that to small people in your life kids or nephews or something like that stick don't let what they say bother you but that that's impossible i'm just saying it's just impossible our words matter our words are strong our words are powerful and we get messed up with our words so many times, and maybe it's just because I'm getting older, my, my hearing is not as great as it used to be. I mishear what somebody might say. And if you mishear what somebody says just a little bit, that affects a lot, depending on the conversation. You go home, and you might be crying because you misheard somebody. Just a word gets jumbled up. Even to the point that they've come up with board games that have to do with words that are Miss, like they just, what, what is it, Mad Libs or Mad Gaps? So I don't have them on the board, but I'm going to read slowly a few of them, and you have to tell me the correct pronunciation or whatever. Ape, hand, hub, hair. Got that one? Good. I just said the word ape, hand, hub, and hair. A panda bear. So somebody might say something in your life, and you hear them wrong. You ever done that? You'd be like, I don't know if I heard that right. Now, if you're smart and you're wise, you, you might want to get some clarity, right? Like, hey, can, I, can, I, can you say that again? Because I need some clarity. If you have that game and you like that game, you know it's kind of funny because everybody messes up all the words. And here's another one. Uh, Dawn, Dutch, mice, tough. Don't touch my stuff. Yeah, y'all all got that. You're so good with words, right? Everybody chimed in. So clearly we need help with words. So tonight we're talking about your words. My words, your words, our words. Words coming in, words coming out. They're important. They're all around us. We need help from God's word. So let's pray. God, thank you for your word tonight. God, I pray that you would open up our ears so we could hear it. God, I pray that you would open up our hearts so we could receive it. Lord, it's uh, very simple to say that we should watch our mouths. But God, your word is pure, flawless, God. And it's important for us to turn our attention to your word and let it speak to us about our words. So I pray that that happens and is accomplished tonight. Lord, we love you. I thank you for my friends and family who are here tonight. I pray that you speak to them, reveal your truth to them in their hearts. We love you and we pray this in your good name. Amen. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. What's he talking about here? He's not talking about school teachers. He's talking about people who would stand before someone else like this who would open up scrolls or open up God's word in front of people. He's saying that's a dangerous business doing that. He says not many of you should do that because you'll, you will be judged by what you say. And if you've been around me long enough, and you've, many of you, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, you've been sitting here, 
And I don't know, but if we were to, like, if you were, like, word counting, click, 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 click. Like, I have a lot of words that come out of my mouth. And I've been doing ministry for almost, uh, more, uh, well, maybe over 20 years. And I've been saying a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff to a lot of people. And I have some of my sermons that I've, that I've gone back and I've read, some of the ones I did 15 years ago. And I'm so glad those aren't recorded. Like this, this verse right here, like it, it hits me. And ever since I started doing ministry, one of the things that I've always kind of told myself is, um, God, I don't care about being funny. I don't care about being cool. I don't care about if people really enjoy me or really like me. I just don't want to be wrong. I just want to be right. And so it's caused me to just be like, God, what does your word say? Like, I want, I want to say, and I want to reflect and, and represent what God's word says. I don't want to add my words to it. For one is I'm going to be judged a little stricter. And so he starts right out the gate knowing that, hey, words matter. And if you're to the point to where you're going to teach somebody, your words really have to matter. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. We would agree with that. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to also bridle his whole body. Now James is taking this little bitty, this, this circle on your face that has phrases that come together and launch forward audibly. He says that's one of the most powerful, potent, scary things ever. And it's so much powerful enough to where if you're able to completely, he said if somebody's able to truly, completely tame their tongue, then everything else is falling in line. Now, you might be sitting there and be like, well, I don't cuss. Well, good. I'm glad you don't. I don't like hearing it from you, so don't say it. But there's other things, too, that come out of our mouths that we need to pay attention to. So if anyone does not stumble in what he says, it's a perfect man, able to also bridle his whole body. If we put bits in the mouths of horses, many of you might get the horse uh, illustration here. I, for one, aren't fond of horses. But if you put a bit in a horse's mouth and so that it will obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. They are so large, and they're driven by strong winds, and they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So he's trying to paint this picture. He painted, he's painted a couple of pictures before for us as we've done this reading. He says, think about a ship. That small piece of the ship can steer the whole thing. That small little bit in the horse's mouth, and the horse is very powerful. He says, so also is the tongue a small member, yet it boasts great things. And he starts thinking, starts giving us words, pictures, and, and words. He says, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. He's, it's, so for James, and obviously for God's word, it's a little more than just, hey, watch, watch your mouth. He's saying this powerful. Your tongue. Now, I'm not talking about the muscle in your mouth, but what it produces, your mouth, what it produces is very, very powerful for every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed. We know some that are harder to tame than others. I haven't seen a whole lot of people with a pet lion. And they have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, he's saying this term of endearment, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine? Can it produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So now he's, say, he's saying there's this 
powerful thing that happens, and it's, it's our words, not just the tongue itself. He's saying our words are powerful, but there's also there's something underneath. Your words that come out of your mouth, that is a fruit of a deeper root, always, always is. Now, there's a lot of fruit to root talk that we can do, especially in the Bible. But with this right here, that it's so practical, so practical for us tonight that we can look at. Just the power of your words. So let's look. There's going to be a bunch of verses come up. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. So first of all, let's look. The first thing, and this is bad, um, bad English. Point one is bad English. Point two is bad English too. Okay, I'm an English minor. My mom was an English teacher. So if you're an English person, we're going to use bad English, bad grammar for the sake of emphasis. Emphasis. Okay. So, first thing, don't say what doesn't need to be said. Okay. Don't say what doesn't need to be said. Proverbs 21, 23. Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Get that verse? So if you can tame your mouth, your tongue, it's going to keep you out of trouble. Now, as we're thinking about this, many of you probably at this point are thinking about some times maybe you got in trouble with, with your words. That's okay. You should think about those. Maybe it's recent. Now, here's what we can't do. We can't be like, well, what about the person that, what about the mute person, the person who can't speak? Maybe they don't even literally have a tongue, and they can't speak. Are they perfect? No, you got to kind of get a little deeper than that because it's a, it's a root thing. There's fruit and root because you can be thinking of something and not say it. And, you know, some people are like, thinking it's the same as saying it. Well, we'll see. We don't know. Um, studies. I was looking at this today, and I thought it was kind of funny. Studies show, I was thinking, just thinking of spoken words, like how many words do we speak, like a day, a minute. And I didn't really, because the others, they were so drastically separated. Like one said, you know, 10,000, one said more. But all of them said, what, that women say way more words than men. All the studies say that, like by a lot. I didn't, I didn't say, hey, babe, listen to this. I didn't tell my wife. But studies show that women say way more words than men, maybe because they need to be, we have more stuff that we need to hear. I don't know. So what doesn't need to be said? Let's just talk just really practical. And I want to put some of these up here. Um, what doesn't need to be said? So I'm going to leave this up here. We're going to kind of talk about each one of these. I'm going to leave this up here if you want to write all this down. It's going to be up there for a minute because I'm going to kind of go through all of these. What does, here's some things that just don't need to be said. First of all, lying. You know, the Bible says don't lie, right? I mean, if, I mean, there's no real hard way to unpack that. Stop, don't lie. Now, a little white lie or falsifying something just a little bit. It, well, there's, there's, so when you say don't lie, got it. I'm not going to lie to you. But however, sometimes we cannot be truthful. And sometimes, here's the sad thing. A lot of people get really good at not being very truthful. And that offends, that offends the heart of God. If we are really good and that's, I'm not just talking about like just big, weird lies like, hi, my name's Jim. Well, that's a lie. Your name is not Jim. But just kind of, you know, just kind of just massaging the truth a little bit to where it's just a little bit of fabrication in there enough to where that's really not that true. Now, you're good at this. I'm good at this. I wish I wasn't. This is one of those things. The Bible says don't lie. You're like, okay, good, got it. That's an easy one. I'm going to move on now to harder things, like harder, harder sins that I'm really struggling with. However, when you really think about all the relationships, all the communications that you have with everybody, are you really genuinely being truthful with everyone? Your parents, your spouse, 
your boss, your coworker, lying, false witness. Now, that would seem like, well, that's a lot like lying, right? Well, I, I think so, but false witness is, is you specifically lying or bearing false witness against someone else, making, making a statement that is untrue concerning the reality of someone else. So now you've really damaged your fellow man because you bore fa- false witness. Now, that's kind of like lying, but lying is kind of a bigger picture. False witness is you lying about somebody else. Just don't do it. I mean, it's one of the Ten Commandments. I mean, God's serious about us being truthful, especially when it deals with how we deal with our neighbor. Offensive words. Now, these aren't necessarily... You know, when, it's, when the Bible talks about offensive language and offensive... Like, it's not necessarily talking about, you know, culturally established curse words. Like, there are some offensive things that people can say. That shouldn't be coming out of your mouth, especially if you're a believer. Those kind of salty things should not be coming out of the, the fresh water that is, that, that's us as believers. Collins, now I could say something offensive here, like the word loser. You know, the Olympics are coming up. There's going to be a loser. Me saying, that guy, he didn't win, so therefore he's the loser. That's not very offensive. But I could change that a little bit and talk to you about you and call you a loser. Be like, that's kind of offensive. Or like the word coward. I don't have any kind of like weird feeling up here saying the word coward. But it can be very offensive. If I go up to you and say, I've known you a long time. I've observed the pattern in your life. You're a coward. Ouch. That's offensive. I mean, there's so many things that we can say that are offensive. Offensive words, whether it's just just kind of jabbing at somebody, whether it's like a racial slur or something. And then cursing, the next one, cursing. My wife says ugly words. She does. She says that, ugly words. Like if she drops something on her foot, she doesn't say a curse word. She says literally ugly words. Like, that's what she says. She's not in here. That's why I'm saying that. So you can tell her next time you see her, yeah, Rod said up there, you say ugly words all the time. She's going to be like, I do not. So, yeah, so maybe she shouldn't say that. What happens when you drop something on your foot? What happens when you stub your toe? Something comes out, right? Maybe a, (gasps) that's okay. Give a grunt. Replace the foul word with a made-up word, okay? There are certain curse words that our culture just deems inappropriate, and I'm not going to say any of them up here. <clears throat> I mean, I can say a while ago, loser, and nobody's like, oh, but I'm not saying anything else. Avoid saying curse words, <clears throat> even if you stump your toe. Next one, rashness. Now, have you, when's the last time you were talking with somebody and they were getting you know, a little out of hand, and you're just like, you're being a little rash right now, don't you think? You hadn't used that lately, right? Rashness is to speak with ill-considered haste or boldness, okay? That's what the American Heritage Dictionary says. Scripture says, um, do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. Proverbs says that. So rashness would be you just jumping up and just, you know, re- like a reactor going off. You see something, something is said in a conversation with a relationship you have with somebody, and you're just so quick to just be, just blow up really quick. Just, hey, look, just cool off a little bit, right? Just take a deep breath, count to 10. Because what's going to happen is this rashness or this very just quick, ill considered haste in your speech is going to cause you to say something that you're going to regret. You need to listen. Maybe that's why God gave us two ears and one mouth. We should listen twice as much as we speak. Do you have hasty words? Are you quick to be defensive? Now, that's where's the root of that? The root of that is pride. You're having a conversation with, with somebody, and you're very quick to be, get defensive? Well, that's not true. It, well, if I'm like that, then you, you do this all the time. Da, la, la, la. Now you're just being rash, real quick hastily you're putting on this little defensive suit and you're not and you're going to bed upset right 
Just slow down. Just take a, take a, take a breath. Deep breath. It's okay. Boisterous speaking. This is another one that the Bible talks about. The, 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 the dictionary is defining this as rough and stormy or violent speech. Loud, noisy, lacking restraint or discipline. You know people like that? People at ball games are like that, right? <laughs> In Proverbs, it says that the harlot is the one who is boisterous and rebellious. So just t- maybe turn, turn the volume down a little bit. You don't have to be, just, or maybe you can't hear very good and you have to be loud. And I think rashness and just boisterous, I think that can kind of come together. But, you know, here's the thing that you won't find. You won't find somebody that has been walking with Jesus for years and years and years, decades. It might not be sin coming out of their mouth, but you're not going to find that person being all loud, obnoxious, boisterous, and rash, just really quick to say something, even though they might be like, you're, they're, they're not going to be like that. Because they're going to be more mature in their talk, in their words, with their tongue. And they're going to calm down a little bit. I had somebody a long time ago say this is what they pray for their kids. And I think she was saying, telling me this because she's like, I'm really praying this for you. She said that she, she prays that, that God would, would raise the valleys and lower the mountains. I was like, well, why don't we pray God always just raise the valleys to be mountains? But no, you want to get to where you're consistent enough in your thought, in your action, in your speech, that no matter what's really happening, you're just, you're the same. You're not way down here. You're not way up here. You're just, you're just, can, just like cool as a cucumber no matter what's going on. That's what the Bible's leading us towards with that. Slander. Next one, slander. Slander's just cutting someone down. You can slander someone to their face. Just cut them down to their face. Now, there's joking, I think, that sometimes happens with this. It's not necessarily slander because it's kind of like, yeah, I like it or I need it or that kind of thing. Or it's, anyway, but when you really, when you cut somebody down to their face, when you slander someone, it's, it's rough. That's, that's not good. And then when you do it behind their back, you know, when you talk about someone that's not near, like that's, that leads also into probably gossip repeating some kind of idle talk or rumors about somebody else. You know people that do that? You know people that slander people or gossip? And so a lot of these, a lot of these things, here's, what, here's what's going to happen to you. If you're, if you're saying, you know what, I want to be a follower of Christ, and I want to grow in my maturity in him, some of these things you're going to see start tapering away with time. If you're really focusing in on God's word and you're really trying, this, this, this is what's going to happen. It's part of sanctification. And here's also what's going to happen. There's going to be people, and maybe you have relationships with people right now that this, this, these are like markers of their reality. Like they, are, they slander people, they gossip, they cuss, they use offensive words, they, they're just very boisterous and rash about everything. It's kind of hard to be around people like that for a long time. It, it is. I know. I get it. Like, that's tough. It's tough to have a consistent, long-term relationship with somebody that talks like that. And because one of the things that happens is you start, you start taking on that a little bit. And you might start saying that or agreeing. You're not doing the gossiping, but if somebody is gossiping, you're like, how, are you, how do you react to that? I mean, are you joining in in the tail-bearing? Are you agreeing with the rumors? Or are you trying to also get the scoop? What, now, what happened now? What they say? No way. You know, as I was thinking about, I picked up my wife a while ago, but um, I've been married to her for over 20 years now, and she's really good at, I would say, probably all of these. Like, I've never known her to slander or gossip. Like, we, we've been in and out of different ministry positions for, for our whole marriage, and people know her and trust her and they they confide in her and you know when somebody comes up to me if they say hey can I tell you something I'm like yeah you can talk to me hopefully you hopefully you can trust that I'm not going to turn around and talk to somebody if you come up to me and say uh, Rod I need to talk to you and you can't tell anybody I'm going to stop you right there because first of all for the most part if you're telling me I might 
need to say something to somebody else if you're in danger in yourself or somebody else. So you can't just tell me, you can't, you got to swear not to say anything. Now, really, the person who says that also, that's coming out of their mouth. Those are words coming out of their mouth. And they're probably immature a, a little bit too. Right? I mean, if somebody comes up to me and says, i got to tell you something, but you've got to swear not to tell anybody. You know, that's not something somebody that's seasoned in the faith is actually going to say. So our words are something that this, as James says, it's this massive reality in the life of everybody. And it affects so many things. But it's one of those things that over time, if we're walking with God, like he starts, he has to grab a hold of our throat our whole life. And he starts, he needs to fix all these things. So maybe you don't have curse words that you use when you stub your toe. But maybe you slander a little bit. Or maybe you gossip a little bit. What about judging? Condemning someone in an unmerciful and unloving way. Now the Bible also talks about accountability a lot. I can say something out of my mouth with my words that somebody can hear and be like, man, that's kind of harsh, right? That's kind of judgmental, don't you think? There's a fine line between lovingly holding someone accountable and just mercilessly judging someone. It's, it's one of the, judge, when you say don't judge, it's one of those things where I think a lot of people are like, I don't know how you, how do I define that? And, you know, people jokingly say stuff, you, you're, why are you so judgy right now? Like, well, here's the thing. If I say to James, because he's wearing a red shirt, and I believe red shirts are evil. Just kidding, I don't. Just for scenario. If I say, let's say red, wearing a red shirt's evil, and I go to James, and I say, James, you're a terrible person for wearing that shirt. You're, you're, man, you are so messed up for wearing that shirt. I'm judging him. I'm pronouncing a judgment on him. I don't mean to do that. But if he's wearing a red shirt and it's causing him harm or other people harm, and if I'm a Christian brother, then I need to go to him with my words and say, hey, James, what, what are you doing, man? You can't wear a red shirt. You know you can't wear a red shirt. You know if you wear a red shirt, it hurts you and it, it can hurt other people. Am I judging him? Am I telling it, him that he's a horrible person for wearing red? Or am I going to him saying, hey, you, you don't need to do that. So that's why I say there's a fine line between pronouncing judgment on somebody to their face and using that same kind of slant and using it for accountability. We all need people that hold us accountable, okay? If you've had people in your life that have, in a way, functioned like accountability partner in your life, and they've come to you before, and they've addressed something in your life, and you kind of push back, and you're like, man, don't be judging me. Like, this, I, I, don't, I don't do everything right, but I do this. And you know it's not that big a deal. I'm, I'm not really hurting anybody else, so just leave me alone. You're just judging me, man. Maybe they're holding you accountable. Now, depending on how the conversation goes, maybe they are being judgmental. That's one of those things that you need to ask God for wisdom. So as you're growing in your walk and in your relationship with God, you're growing in how you use your mouth, your words, your tongue, because it happens all the time. You speak thousands of words throughout your whole day. Some of you talk more than others, and you know you do. But this is something you're going to be doing the rest of your life, and that's talking, interacting with people with your words. So I think it's good to be talking about this. It's good for us to, to consider these things so we can get them right. So, yeah, there's a delicate matter requiring careful balance between accountability and judging. Outburst of anger. You ever, you ever had one of those days where this didn't really go on that good? And then on top of that, this happened? And then all of a sudden you realize that there's a mess left here. And then this happened here and this happened here. And next thing you know, like it's the, the steamer in the pot is and you're ready to blow up. And then you go shouting out and you just, you just yell or toss something or mad. You kick something and you didn't really hurt anybody. You didn't really hit anybody that was laying there when you kicked them. But this outburst of anger, like that, that's coming from. That's coming from a boiling point. Maybe you got an anger issue. That's the root. And the fruit that's coming out is just burst of anger. 
I've, I've talked to so many people that's been in relationships with somebody that's got like an anger problem. And, it's, and the fruit of that is that depending on how that person is having their day, everybody else in their life is kind of like tiptoeing around them. Like, I don't want to do anything that's going to just blow them up, set them off. I grew up in a house like that. It's devastating growing up in a house like that. And if you're walking with the Lord, this outburst of anger, what's going to happen is you're growing in the fruits of the Spirit, and one of those is self-control. One of the things that I have to do often, because I got a lot going on in my house, I got a lot going on in my life, I have to, you know, I'll, I'll pull into my driveway sometimes, and I've told a lot of guys this, and before I get out, I tell myself, what would a fantastic dad do right now? What would a fantastic husband do right now? I have to tell myself. Because what a lousy husband or a lousy dad would do would have an outburst of anger. I don't want to be like that. Boasting. You know people like that? They seem a little arrogant. They brag a little bit. They build their self up around others. Most, I, would, I don't know if this is a, a lady thing, but this is definitely a guy thing. You know, guys, are, they do this. They kind of, you know, and then the other guys just kind of be like, all right, he's here. Let's walk around. Let's, let's, let's move. They're going to be arrogant. They're going to boast. It's not, this shouldn't be coming out of our mouths. We, well, I mean, you talk about the root to fruit there. I mean, if you think way too much of yourself, then that's going to come out of your mouth. Well, look at how great I am, everyone, please. Bitter speech. You know, Paul warns that let all bitterness, Paul says let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. So those are big words that he uses in Ephesians chapter 4, 31. Those are big words that he uses, and he begins with bitter. Let all bitterness. So I think sometimes, like there's just bad things that happen in our life. And you will go through bad things with relationships with people, with whatever. And you're going to find what's going to happen is there's going to be a sliver root of bitterness that wants to like weasel its way in your heart. For whatever reason, you're going to have these little bitter roots that are going to try to dive in and settle in. And sometimes those bitter roots start showing up by by something you might say. And it could be in the form of gossip. It could be in the form of complaining. But really what it is, is just bitter talk. You just, it's just bitterness coming out. Now that bitterness that just is infused, I'm glad nobody's sitting on the front row. But, like, you don't want to sit on the front row of somebody's life if they're just spewing bitterness a lot. That stuff gets on you, and you're like, oh. Like, you want to, like, wash it off. But it's continually coming out of their heart, spewing out of their mouth. Now, it's hard to deal with very hard things that have happened to us. A deep seed, just a deep seed of forgiveness and grace and mercy needs to start cutting some of those bitter roots and so maybe you're not, maybe it's not outbursts of anger or curse words, or, but depending on how you word it, depending on what you're talking about, like is it bitterness, is it bitter speech? Next one, these are tough, aren't they? Flattery. I don't see this a lot, maybe because I don't have much that I'm, you know, that people can flatter me about. Excessive or insincere praise, that was a joke, I don't like my jokes either, that's okay. Excessive or insincere praise. Praise. Now, this is probably more in a situation where there's some type of, uh, of I guess, promotion that can happen or something like that, where you're trying to you're trying to flatter somebody. The Bible says in Proverbs twenty six twenty eight, a flattering mouth works ruin. Working like that's so contradictory. I love it. A flattering mouth works really hard to ruin something. So just, I mean, you might be like, I kind of I kind of do this a little bit. Now, this is not compliments, okay? Here's what, and, and you know what? There's actually a national compliment day. I love it. I, I wish more people would compliment each other. Like telling somebody, hey, man, your hair looks fantastic. High five. That's not flattering. That's not like unnecessarily flattering someone. Now, if you tell me that, if y'all all tell me that today before we leave, Hey, Rod, your hair looks fantastic. Now you're just joking, and I don't appreciate it. It's rude. Just kidding. But just flattering. 
uh, contentious speech, verbal combat. You know, people that just like to be argumentative. You just like to be, you just like to, like to argue. I don't like to argue. I'm not very good at, at that. I usually just kind of shut down and let, let them kind of, whoever I'm arguing with, and I'm like, are we good? Are we going to do something else now? Let's try something else now. I don't really do the verbal combat very well. Proverbs 21.9, it's better to live <laughs> in a corner of a roof than in a house shared with a quarrelsome or contentious woman. I love that mind picture that the writer of Proverbs, like, you know what? If somebody is contentious, if they're quarrelsome, if they like to argue a lot, it's better for that person to, to build like a little hut on the roof than live in the house with that woman. I don't know. I mean, why does he? I don't know. I can tell me this later. Proverbs 20. Huh? <laughs> That's why I didn't put it on the screen, Jonathan, because I didn't want you to use it against some your own self is really what you would use it against. Proverbs 26, 21, like charcoal to hot embers and wood to a fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. You know, somebody that just starts trouble, they just kindle up, they just stir up strife, just being just contentious, argumentative. Complaining or murmuring. This is one of those things that, um, you know, I, there's a line, I think, that if you're going to somebody that you confide in and you want to express something that you're dealing with, like, hey, I've just, man, I've been bogged down with this. Like, can you pray for me? Can we talk about it? That's one thing. And it kind of feels like they're complaining. And it kind of feels like you want to be like, you're just complaining. Just be quiet and get over it. But that's not really the same thing. But I'm, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. The person that no matter what's happening, they're like, well, that's not very good. Well, that's not very nice. Well, that, if somebody, and, and here's what happens. Like when somebody like lightens the mood with a comment or something like that, they're like, you know what? Man, the sky is beautiful. Well, I think I've probably seen better. That's complaining in my opinion. Like you're complaining that my beautiful sky that I'm seeing is not as beautiful as the one you've seen seven years ago when everything was fantastic in your life and now you're just sad and mad and mean. Quit complaining. Just quit complaining. Just stop murmuring. Stop. The Bible just says do everything without complaining. Now I know that's hard for some of you because you have very stressful things in your life. Whether it's a relationship or something that you got to deal with all the time. You have hard things, like maybe, maybe it's medical something you got to deal with. Maybe it's something, maybe you're having to care for somebody, and it's just hard sometimes. I don't know, but there's a lot of things in our life that we can really be upset and complain about. When my uh, aunt, she had cancer, she was passing away, she fought a long, hard fight with cancer. I remember after she lost her fight, I remember thinking, I never heard her complain once. She was in constant pain. It was constant bad news. She was constantly not being able to go to things and do things. And not one time did she complain. In fact, she might have complained at the fact that she didn't want to put too much on us. I was like, like, like we want to help you. Like, we're here. And I didn't really see that complaint. I thought that was kind of the opposite. You know, people that complain, murmur. What about, like, mocking? I don't know if mocking's out there. Did I put mocking up? Yeah, mocking. I got in trouble one time when I was in school. A lot. But this is one time I'm going to tell you about. <laughs> this happened more than once, but I'm telling you about this one time. I got in trouble. I think it was in the first grade. I got in big trouble. And the, the write-up or whatever was because I was mocking the teacher. And I remember, like, getting in trouble because the teacher said something. And I was like... You know, I was kind of like, nah, 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 nah. and I got in trouble for that. And I think I mocked her because she was getting on to me. I like mocked more. You can't mock me. You can't mock me. <laughs> Stop that. Stop that. Like, like, I know that's little kid. Like, little kids do mocking and stuff like that. But I think mocking should be in there. So, you know, let's put all the mocking. Foolish speech. Just, you know, and, and part of this is kind of hard to deal with when you talk about foolish speech because it's just like emptiness. Like thick-headedness. People talking about something that's just like dumb and just like, let's move on. Um, cruel or harsh words. What about just being mean or insensitive? You know, like that's part of that's just maybe just an attitude. 
Like somebody's got an attitude and they come out and, and it's not like they're using really foul language, not just using really harsh things. Maybe it's just a little bit cruel. It's just a little, little cruel. Maybe a little insensitive. And maybe you have a conversation with somebody, you get in the car with whoever you're with and ask them, you know, that conversation that we just had, was that a little insensitive there? And if they look at you with big eyes like, I can't talk to you about this because you're, you're going to blow up. Maybe you got other problems you got to talk about, right? So maybe consider your words. What about the next one? Just vulgarity and sexually suggestive speech, dirty jokes, filthiness, indecent, lewd, obscene. You know, I know that depending on the, the, the type of environment that you find yourself in, there might be some joking and stuff like that, that you're either going to, it's, it's one of those things where like, I don't know what to do. Do I just like, they're talking about stuff that's inappropriate. What do I do? Just like slip away. And if you slip away too weird, they're going to be like, what are you doing? And you're like, <laughs> like it's, it's so like as a Christian, like when you're involved in conversations with people who they're not, they're not, and sometimes it's because they're not believers and they don't have any kind of like, uh, you know, compass in their heart to say like, I shouldn't be talking about this person like this. I shouldn't be joking about her or him like that. And they don't have anything like that. And you do. And it's so, I, I remember just having this time in my life where I'm like, I, don't, I have a hard time fitting in with certain people because they're saying these things and I don't want to participate. And I'm just like standing there, like not laughing at it. And everybody else is laughing. I'm like, and I like, don't want to chime in. Everybody else is chiming in. It's a little obscene, a little lewd. I'm just like, you know, just, you just stand there and make a weird face. And then you find yourself just kind of disappearing from some of those circles. You don't participate in some of those conversations. And then what happens, oftentimes what happens, is the people that are in those circles, they look around and they're like, where are you? Like, you're not in that circle anymore. Like, what's, what's wrong? Like, you're not participating in our lewdness. Why aren't you participating in our lewdness? <laughs> they don't say that, right? And you have a hard time with that because you want to be like, and, and you want to say, well, you know, I'm really trying to honor God with my thoughts and my speech and filthy jokes is not really where it's at. And they're going to be like, well, church ladies here now, right? Like, look at you. Like, well, look, it's everybody, the church ladies here. Yeah, that's great. Let's tell a dirty joke to the church lady. And you're just pigeonholed in this spot. And you're just like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't want to be mean and rude to somebody and be like, Y'all are nasty. Quit talking about that. Because, I mean, let's just be honest. If lost people get together, they're not going to talk about sanctified stuff. They're not going to be talking about the scripture that, that's been, you know, interfering with their reality lately. They're not going to be talking about the Bible verses that they're trying to get a hold of. They're not going to be doing that. They're going to be talking about all this other stuff. And it's hard for you as a believer to find yourself comfortably in a circle, right? And this is going on. And you know what? Honestly, it's harder for some of y'all than it is for me. I mean, I'm, I'm a pastor. And I, when, when, when guys get together, one of the first things that has to kind of go around the room is, well, what do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? I lay brick. I'm a construction worker. I'm a pastor. Ooh. <laughs> I'll start. Y'all go ahead and talk because I just made it all weird for you. But you know, I mean, this is what you're around all the time. And so you have to find that place in your life as a Christian where you push away from this, but you don't go off in some cave and hide and you're, you're this person that's like, you look different, you talk different, and when it, any, any of this just kind of is going around, you're just like, well, all right now, boys and girls, let's not talk like that. It's just difficult, isn't it? Like, we've been fighting this, like, some of y'all are older than me, and you've been in the faith longer than I have. You've been fighting this a long time, right? It's difficult. But the foolish speech, the cruel words, the vulgarity, the evil speech, those things, like, that's why we need to have this conversation, because the Bible talks a lot about our words. The Bible says, speaking of evil speech, the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Now, I don't know how you want to define evil speech. False witness up there twice. <laughs> Y'all see that? Did you notice that? Paying attention, making notes, Andrew? That was for you. <laughs> I don't really know how you really want to define evil speech. But maybe it's something a little subtle that's like, that's just wrong. Or maybe it's something pretty big on a scale that just is like, well, you don't need to say that. 
So maybe you're not, maybe evil speech is not something that you struggle with, right? You don't, you're not like waking up one day and you're like, well, I'm sure it's a great day to honor Satan. Oh, wait, it's evil speech, right? You know, that's not something maybe you struggle with. But you, when we kind of unpack all these, and if at first we say, hey, watch your mouth, watch your tongue, because it's important. The book of James just says, hey, it's a big deal. You need to pay attention to how you speak. Most of the time, people are like, well, I don't really cuss, so I'm okay. However, when you start really unpacking some of these, like, let's just be honest, y'all. Like, we, we do this way, way more than we should. And maybe, maybe you're... Maybe you don't, you know, look back and inventory your life and say, well, I've a little, little too much flattering. I've been doing a little too much flattering lately. I'm going to work on flattering. And you're going to come up to me later and say, I'm really convicted about flattering. Will you pray for me? Like, you're probably not going to do that. I get it. But there's so many things that the Bible kind of steers us towards. Hey, don't talk like that. So those are some things that we don't need to say. Don't talk like that. But now let's move to number two, bad English again. Do say what does need to be said. So don't say what doesn't need to be said. That's pretty simple, right? And do say what does need to be said. Speak life. Look, speak life into people. I think that's the first one that's coming up. Just speak life. Like you're in a situation. And you're, you're, you're kind of pigeonholed in the conversation around work or whatever like that. And there's a lot of just flattering and boisterous clamoring going on that you're like uncomfortable around because you don't like being around boisterous clamoring and slander and gossip because you're trying to be the good Christian person. Well, maybe you can be the person that just starts angling in some life in that conversation with someone. You know, when somebody's complaining about something and you want to be like, dude, you're annoying me. All you do is complain. I'm going to go get some coffee. Be quiet. And that's not speaking life into a complainer. It's, and it's harder to say the things that we are supposed to say, I would say, is more difficult than just getting to the point where we see all this list of things we're not supposed to say and be like, okay, there's my list of things I'm not supposed to say. Check. Got it. I think saying the things that we are supposed to say is more difficult. Why? Because if I'm in a conversation happening and there's some weird things that are, they're talking about, it's easier for me to what? Dip out, right? Just slide out the back. I'm not going to participate in this. It's so much harder for me to, to speak life into a situation. If you're in a situation where somebody's crumbling something with their words, it's difficult to know what to say. It's so much easier just to Zip it, be quiet, I'm just going to close my mouth. And sometimes the wisest thing to do might just be shut up. But sometimes we need to speak life. Like in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your, now, out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. That's speaking life, building up, as fit for the occasion that may give grace to those who hear. So if somebody's always blowing up in anger, and they're always complaining. It might be hard, but how do, you need to pray and ask God, like, God, I need to speak life towards this person, but I don't know what to say. It's a lot easier for me to just zip my mouth and walk away. There are people, there are Christians all over the country, all over the world, that are in situations regarding relationships or whatever like this, and they are stuck on the edge. They're about to step into the 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 insanity of speaking life into a situation, and they're thinking, like, this is going to end this relationship. I'm going to get fired if I speak life into this. And there's so many people, there's so many believers that are, they're, they got their foot up in whatever situation. They're like, they're so ready to speak life into something, and then instead what they do is just they dip out. That's the easier thing. When you get enough courage and enough wisdom and enough boldness to speak life into a situation, you might be s sitting there in, a, in a, a desk somewhere looking across from your supervisor and be like, you, you can't tell people that. I'm going to have to let you go. That's the third time that you've done that. And here you are suffering because you decided to do the hard thing, and that's bravely, courageously 
speak life. Your hope was to build somebody up. Your hope was to come up under them and say something that would encourage them, but it kind of backfired a little bit. That happens a lot. So speak life. Be bold and courageous enough with your words to speak life. I feel like we've all been in situations with that other list countless times. We've just seen conversation or jokes or something's going on around us, and it's just like we don't know what to do, and we just stop. I, don't, I feel like we could all tell story after story after story of that, from, from that other list. And I wish we could just have a long list of stories of how, you know, in this situation I was in, I just boldly spoke life into it. And all these people looked at me like, that, what are you talking about, man? We don't, that's weird. And then I did it again the next time they were talking about it, and they're like, really, that's kind of weird. But then the next day, like, somebody else came up to me, and they were like, hey, man, like, what you said the other day, you really think like that? You really believe that? Yeah, man. It's, I believe it's true. I think God has put that in me, and I've just been reading the Bible, and that's, that's kind of how my thinking thinks when I think about somebody else. And, like, that's different. So sometimes speaking life is the hardest thing, but it's the best thing. It gives grace to those who hear. Speak encouragement. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Encourage somebody. That's easy. That's so easy. Some of you are very good at encouraging me. And some of you are very good at encouraging other people. Keep doing that. Keep doing that. And some of you have a hard time with that because maybe you don't really think about it. And, and so here's what happens. When, you're, when you have a prayer life, you're praying for things that are going on. You're praying for yourself. You're praying for other people. When you're praying and you're thinking about somebody, like, you know, they, they're going through this. You know, I think about some of the, the families in our church that are, that are pregnant. I'm like, and I'm praying for y'all. I'm like, man, that's a, that's, a, that's a big burden. It's a heavy burden to carry, right? And it's hard and you need prayer. Well, when you're praying for somebody, it's okay in the middle of your prayer. It's totally okay to do this. While you're praying for somebody, to stop right away. Pick up your phone and send them a text. Hey, I was just praying, thinking about you. Love you. Hope you're doing great today. Have a fantastic, week, fantastic weekend. Send. Okay, all right, God, thank you for putting them on my heart. Hopefully I encourage them a little bit. Now, did I speak? Those weren't words, but that was coming out of my heart, and it was kind of like me speaking to you, right? Honestly, me, my favorite way of communicating is texting. I told this to somebody the other day. Somebody was, I had like four different people telling me four different things at one time. And I'm like, what was that he said? But if I have a digital trail, oh, yeah, uh, August 25th at 4 p.m. That's what you said. I remember now. Speak encouragement. That's it. Speak healing. Proverbs 12, 18. The tongue of the wise brings healing. There are situations people have in their life, they've been trampled down, they've been broken down, they've been beaten down. And you don't have to have some glorious big truth to just unroll on them with fancy words. Sometimes it's just like, man, I, 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 I've heard that you've been going through some stuff, and you know what, I don't, I don't really relate specifically to what you're going through, but I think I've been there a little bit, and I just want to let you know that I'm with you. If you need anything, you holler at me. We'll, we'll get together. We'll chat. Let's go get a burrito or something. I want to I wanna help you. You realize that that's like better than medicine sometimes? Do you realize that? Do you realize that your words to other people can be better than a bottle? With a little script on it. There's a lot of people, I believe, all around us that are going to bottles and instead of them going to bottles, maybe you should go to them. You should go to them. And if all Christians just said, you know, my words are, I can speak healing into somebody. And we just went to people. I think there'd be empty bottles all over the place. And I'm tired of bottles. I'm tired of knowing people that struggle with them. Pill bottles, other bottles. Like, it's just, I just wish we could disinfect most of them. And I just think of the hope that we have in Christ. That we just go to people and be like, hey, 
It's been going on lately. Let's get together. Just feed people. So think about that. This is, you know, this is something that you could practically do. Who in your life that you know that you need to speak some healing into? And it might be somebody you haven't talked to in a while. It might be kind of a rift in your relationship. Uh, it's a little dicey. It's been 10 years since you've talked to them. Maybe you need to speak some healing into them. And maybe you can just start out by just pointing out the elephant in the room. Hey, it's been 10 years since we've talked, and I think a lot of that has to do with it's my fault, and I'm getting over some stuff, and I want to let you know that I think about you. I care about you. Is there anything that I can help you with? And I think that leads to the, the, the next one is speak truth. What do people really need to hear? What people really need to hear is they really need to hear truth. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy always, being prepared to give a defense for anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that you have, and do it with gentleness and respect. So first of all, people are asking you about the hope that you have because your life just eludes hope. Something about you is different. Like, what is it? Hopefully people will ask you that. And you're ready to talk about what that is. You're ready to use your words. Acts 1.8, Jesus tells us this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and all Samaria to the end of the earth. So our, our words that we say, stuff that comes out of our mouth, maybe digitally through a text thread, our words, they're always, always going to be the fruit of a root. Everything that you say. And my prayer is that you see it like that. All those bad fruits that we saw, like there's a bad root somewhere. And I pray that you, you, you notice that and you want to like cut that off and replace it with a gospel root. So if you have a tendency to maybe talk ill towards somebody or you have a tendency to complain, then basically the gospel root that needs to be there is you need to realize that Jesus is, is, is good enough for you. And everything that he's done is enough for you. You don't need to complain about not having what you don't have. Because if you have Christ, what more do you need? And that's just the gospel that God has given us. We can't bless the Lord and then curse our neighbor. We can't just complain and murmur and slander people and expect to really honor God with sincere prayer and praise and worship. So number three, the last thing, we need to embrace what God has said. So don't say what you don't need to say. Do say what you do need to say and embrace what God has said. Our life, our hope, our identity is found in his word, his heart, his character, his will. That's our identity. Now, you're, now what you're seeing is a root that's going deeper to a bigger root, and that's your identity in Christ. Who you are in him based on what God has said about you. And all this fruit starts, starts coming forth from that. That's our identity in him. Who we are. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's what? A new creation. You're new in him. Your old has passed away. It's gone. The filthy talk, it's gone. Let that pass away. 1 Peter 2, nine. but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Look, I'm no longer me anymore. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, everything that comes out of my life in the flesh is just deeply rooted in, in the faith that I have in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself. He died for me. This is Paul just leaning on the gospel and everything. Just leaning on what Jesus did and everything. And so that, like he's got these roots that get to another root that goes deeper in the deepest part of who he is. And that's who he is in Christ because of the gospel. So that's why we always need to talk about that deep root of who we are. Because that root stems off. And it changes the way we do all kinds of other things that we've talked about in the book of James. And tonight we're talking about our words. So if you're a child of God, praise God that 1 John 
or John 1, 12 says, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, that he gave the right to become children of God. So are you a child of God? If that's yes, listen, believer, Christian, beloved, I love you. Your words are very powerful. Pay attention to what you use with your words. And God's word is more powerful. If you have a hard time with your words, turn your attention to God's word. Because that changes some of the change that comes out of here if you dig into God's word. Maybe you say, no, I don't think I'm a child of God today. Maybe you're like, you know, I don't, I really have a hard time with the words that I say. Now, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not a Christian. It just probably means you need to work on some stuff. But maybe, maybe there's somebody in here and you're like, you know what, I don't, I don't really think I'm, I don't really think I'm a child of God. I don't really think I'm a believer. Then I'd love to be a part of your story today and we can start a rewrite we can start rewriting that story just come to me or come to one of the leaders here just be like hey i think it's time for me to really step into into faith and really be who god's calling me to be walk with him now in in, in a talk like this sermon like this i think there's a i think with with so many things that i said tonight there's a lot of sp- scattered, sprinkled conviction probably all in the room. And so maybe pinpoint something. Maybe this past week you're like, I, was, I didn't say, I, didn't, I wasn't very good with that thing. Well, good. Pray about that. Ask God to help you with that. Ask him to, to, to help you with repentance in that. Maybe you need to stop saying certain words. Or maybe you need to stop cutting people down. What about the root? Pay attention to the root. Is there a gospel root? If there's not a gospel root, let's get that first. Because that's what stems everything else. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your challenging word. God, I pray that we would see our words as how powerful they are. God, give us the courage to speak life. God, give us the courage to speak encouragement, speak truth. Speak healing into somebody. I've spent way, way too many words speaking things that I shouldn't say. So God, help me realize that the, the, the deeper gospel root in my heart of what Jesus has done for me should cause my words to change. So God, if there's somebody in here, Lord, that maybe they're, they feel like they're not connected to you on a deep, deep root level, Lord, would you, would you speak to them about that? Would you convict them about that? Thank you for hearing our prayers, God. Thank you for hearing our worship. God, thank you for speaking to us. So, Lord, as we sing this next song, God, I pray that you would convict us, give us courage to respond to you. Thank you. We pray this in your good name. Amen.